بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله. Can you turn the mic on for me? Let's switch. جزاك الله خيرا. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله. الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى. خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء. وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد. Today, by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, we gather to study the story of the great companion of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنه. Among the muhaddithun and fuqaha, there is this term. Abadila Arba, which refers to the four famous Abdullahs. When the scholars of hadith or fiqh make this reference, the idea is that this is a strong position, that all four Abdullahs narrate this incident or agree upon this position. Who are these four Abdullahs, Abadila Arba? Imam al-Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he points out that during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the companions, there were over 200 Abdullahs. And this honor that the Muhaddithun gave to the four great Abdullahs in their fields is reserved for Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an, and lastly, Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. These are the four companions. Now, the reason why these four were gathered together as the Abadila Arba is because they were younger, and they lived very long lives, and their students were many. Above them was an was another companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also known as Abdullah, whose name is not included in the four, not because he narrated little or because he wasn't a sign, a symbol of seniority, but rather because he was just much older in age, and these companions lived longer lives. And that was Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. When the narrators of hadith mention the name Abdullah al-Itlaq without any attribution, it commonly refers to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. That when they say Abdullah said this, or the hadith is narrated by Abdullah, it is attributed to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. Now going back to Sayyidina Ibn Umar radiallahu an, Abdullah ibn Umar, as you can tell by his name, he is Abdullah, the son of Umar, and this Umar is referring to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, the great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and leader of the Muslims. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an accepted Islam at a young age and migrated with his father to Medina Munawwara. He did not hit the age of puberty even after he arrived Medina Munawwara. He desired to be enlisted for the battle of Uhud, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rejected him. And it was purely based off of his young age. The first battle that he actually participated alongside Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now he's 14, 15 years old, a little older, is the battle of the trenches, the Khandaq. And then after that, Bay'atul uh, Ridwan and everything that follows from there onwards, he is by the side of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all the major expeditions. His mother, along with his sister, Umm al Mu'minin Hafsa radiallahu anha, who became later on the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was one person. They shared the same mother and the same father. Her name was Zainab bint Mad'oon the sister of the famous Uthman ibn Mad'oon al-Jumahi radiallahu ta'ala an. 
Ibn Umar radiallahu an's story is fascinating and it's beautiful. He is a symbol of Islam. He was the standard of ittiba' al-sunnah, following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will learn from the story of Ibn Umar radiallahu an how he was a legend when it came to generosity. When you turn to the chapter of worship, when it came to the issue of simplicity, his students are so many and they all narrate these beautiful moments for us that Ibn Umar radiallahu an, this was my interaction with him. This is what I saw in Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an. This is how he worshipped. Ibn Umar radiallahu an, if he missed his Isha Salah in Jama'ah, his students narrate, he would not sleep for the rest of the night. He would then spend the rest of the night in Ibadah because he wanted to make up for the virtue he missed out on by not praying Isha Salah in Jama'ah. Many stories like this. Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi, while listing the names of the students of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, the list goes on and on and on for many of the other companions. When you read in the Seer Alam al it'll be a few lines, maybe a paragraph, two paragraphs of the names. But for Sayyidina Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he narrates over 200 people. 200 and among them were Sahaba and among them were also great Tabi'een Sahaba would come and narrate from this Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh, who was younger in age bear in mind that at the time of Khandaq which happened in the fourth year after migration he was 14 years old so by the time Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes away he's somewhere around his 20, 21 years of age but senior companions come to him and they're asking him, tell us about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He narrates narrations regarding how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would drink water. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, what were the sunan of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even when it came to something like relieving oneself. You'll find the narrations of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an there. After Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu an who was considered among the muhadithun to be the top narrator of hadith, the second person whose name is listed is the great companion Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an. A person is understood by their students. You learn so much about a person by studying what kind of people they're able to prepare, what kind of human beings they can develop. Giving a lecture is a nice thing, writing a book is also a nice thing. But for longevity, for mass impact, you need someone at the center who has the ability to relate to people and to create other great people. That was the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had amazing lectures and amazing talks and every word of his was phenomenal. But one of the greatest miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the greatest gifts to this ummah was the Sahaba radhwanullahi alayhi wa sallam. Each and every one of them was so special. Fountains of knowledge and wisdom. Now you turn to someone like Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an and begin to go through the list of some of his students and you see people like Hassan al-Basri. You see Saeed ibn Jubair, Ibn al-Musayyib, Ta'us, Urwa bin Zubair, Mujahid, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Qasim bin Muhammad, Maymun ibn Mahran, Makhul al-Azdi, and many others. And each of these people were giants. Each name here represents a legend, a pillar of, of, of knowledge and Islam. And at the top of this, among the many companions who built this generation, also was the name of Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Now, Regarding his name, there's somewhat of a difference of opinion. Most scholars agree that his name from birth was Abdullah. There is another narration that one companion narrates that one of my friends passed away. His name was Abdullah bin Harith bin Jazb. And he said, when it came time for burial, I was there, Ibn Umar was there, and Ibn Amr ibn As was also there. The three of us, our names were As, which means disobedient. That was our birth name. This is what he says. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to go into the grave and said, you are the servants of Allah, go into the grave and lower your friend. So we went into the grave, we lowered his body, and thereafter, because the Prophet referred to us as Abdullah, that the three of you are Abdullah, our names then became Abdullah. Many of the muhadithun reject this narration because uh, obviously because there are some issues regarding the Sanad and some of the narrators in the hadith. And what is commonly known is that Abdullah bin Umar an's name was Abdullah from birth. He was always known as Abdullah. Now if you're wondering why would someone name their child As, disobedient? Among the Arabs, having names like this was a sign of manly, manliness and it was a sign that someone was tough. They had very violent names, you know. Um, so As was one of them too. Similarly, there's another narration that um, is not authentic but common among some and you even see sometimes these statements being written in books that Hafsa radiallahu anha and Ibn Umar radiallahu an, brother and sister, accepted Islam before their own father, before Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. This is also uh, unlikely, because that would mean that um, Ibn, Umar, Ibn Umar radiallahu an accepted Islam at a very young age. And the sanad, the chain to this is also not a connected, not a muttasil narration, it's a munqati'a. Narration. Ibn Umar radiallahu an narrates one incident. He was lucky because his sister was Hafsa radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So because of that, he had a unique access to the Prophet of Allah. He was able to not only ask questions to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly, but also use his sister as someone to ask questions on his behalf. He says that people during the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would share their dreams to the Prophet of Allah. I was young, one night I was sleeping in the masjid and I saw a dream of two angels approaching me and they took me to this fire. It was terrifying, it was very scary. And you know, as they brought me close to the fire, I started saying, A'udhu billahi minan nar, A'udhu billahi minan nar. I seek protection with Allah from the fire. And then the angels turned to him and they said, there's nothing to fear, you have nothing to worry about. So then he woke up and shared this dream with Umm al-Mu'mineen, Hafsa radiallahu anha, who then asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the interpretation. And in response to this, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said one statement, نِعْمَ الرَّجُلُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ لَوْ كَانَ يُصَلِّي مِنَ الليل. How great of a servant, how great of a person is Abdullah, only if he dedicated more time to worshiping Allah during the night hours. Only if he dedicated more time to ibadah. So the narrator says, فَكَانَ بَعْدَهُ لَا يَنَامُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this statement, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh then spent very little of his night in sleep. Most of it he spent awake reading Qur'an, making dua, and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Ibn Umar radiallahu anh was on his deathbed. Sayyid ibn Jubair, he narrates that when Ibn Umar radiallahu anh was on his deathbed, I heard him saying, we heard him saying, we heard him saying, that there are three things that I regret a lot in my life. Number one, I'm going to really regret missing out on fasting during the middle of the hot day. There was a pleasure in that staying hungry for the sake of Allah. The second thing that I have regret over as I leave this world is the joy and pleasure of worshiping Allah in the middle of the night. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me tawfiq to hear the alarm in our context, to stand up from my bed, to have the strength to do wudu, to then spend some time worshiping Allah azza wa jal, that this wasn't something that everyone was able to do, but Allah Azza wa Jal gave me the tawfiq to do it. This is something I'm really going to miss. And the third thing, I wish I had stood up against the rebels and stood by the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. I really, not, I really regret not being with Ali radiallahu an in the battles by his side, supporting him and the right cause. Something he lamented over and had tremendous regret over even right until he passed away. 
Ibn Umar radiallahu an was known by everyone in Medina Munawwara. And so many people narrated hadith from him, including his own servants, including his own children. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi says that the most authentic chain of hadith, Ahsahu al Asanidi Mutlaqan, Malik an Nafi' an Ibn Umar. Malik, Imam Malik, who narrates from Nafi' who narrates from Ibn Umar. This is the most authentic chain that exists because each of these three, po three people were giants and accepted by all. No one made any sort of accusation against any of these people, that their integrity wasn't where it should have been, that they weren't truthful, that they were confused people, that these people didn't have a deep understanding of knowledge. Each of these people were the best of their time. Malik and Nafi' and Ibn Umar. And Imam Malik uses this sanad quite frequently in his Muatta uh, when narrating hadith. Nafi' that same student of Ibn Umar he narrates لَوْ نَذَرْتَ إِلَى بْنِ عُمَرَ إِذَا اتَّبَعَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَقُلْتَ هَذَا مَجْنُونَ If you were to see Ibn Umar my teacher and how particular and punctual he was when it came to following the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you would say the man is lost in love. Hadha majnoon. He's no longer looking left or right. He doesn't care about what people see, what people think. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh is obsessed with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The same student again, Nafi' narrates, أن ابن عمر كان يتبع آثار رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كل مكان صلى فيه. Ibn Umar an would trace back on the roads and paths that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam traveled on and where the Prophet of Allah prayed salah while he was alive. Hatta inna Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nazala tahta shajaratin fakana ibn Umar yata'ahadu tilka shajara. Right until the point that once Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was traveling and he stopped under a tree to pray salah, Ibn Umar radiallahu an noted that exact tree down. And every time he would pass by that tree, he would stop and pray salah in that same place. <laughs> and he would manage that tree to make sure it would not go dry or it would not die. That I'm going to take care of this tree. My prophet prayed salah here. I will keep this tree alive. He would come there, water the tree, pray some salah and move on. And we as students saw how much this man Loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One time, Ibn, again, same Nafi' narrating, says one time Ibn Umar radiallahu an heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, لَوْ تَرَكْنَا هَذَا الْبَابِ لِلنِّسَاءِ How beautiful would it have been if we left this door specifically for women to come and, come and go from. In the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, women would attend. So if this area, this path was left for them so they can come and go at their own convenience, قَالَ نَافِعَ فَلَمْ يَدْخُلْ مِنْهُ إِبْنُ عُمَرْ حَتَّى مَاتْ Ibn Umar radiallahu anh never went near that door until he died. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a desire that path be kept specifically for the women. One of his students narrates, I never saw Ibn Umar radiallahu anh hearing the mention of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِلَّا بَكَى But he fell into tears. He would cry immediately just by hearing the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another one of his students says that one time a person sat in front of Ibn Umar radiallahu anh and recited the ayah of Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 40. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا This same verse when recited to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh. At that moment when Ibn Mas'ud was reciting this verse, the Prophet of Allah broke out into tears. So now a person recites this verse to Ibn Umar radiallahu an, فَجَعَلَ Ibn Umar يَبْكِي Ibn Umar radiallahu an started crying. And not just one or two tears came out of his eyes, his beard and his garment became soaked in tears. One person then turned to the reciter and said, buddy stop, look at this man's state. How much are you going to read this ayah? Every time you read it, he breaks out into tears again. أَقْسِرْ فَقَدْ آذَيْتَ الشَّيْخْ Slow it down a little bit. Take it easy on him. Nafi' narrates that when Ibn Umar radiallahu anh would recite the ayah 
of Surah Al-Hadid, verse number 16. أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has a time not come for the believers that their hearts fall into the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ For the remembrance of Allah that their hearts are humbled, that fear comes into their heart. وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ After all that has been revealed from the truth. بَكَا حَتَّى يَغْلِبَهُ الْبُكَاء He would cry until tears would overcome him. Meaning the state of crying wouldn't just be something small. It wasn't just a few tears, but it would overcome him, his entire state. What he would enter like into a trance of just crying. The state where he couldn't control himself anymore simply by the reciting of an ayah of the Qur'an. Ibn Umar radiallahu an was known for his ibadah. Someone asked Nafi' his servant and khadim that tell us about Ibn Umar radiallahu an inside his home. We've seen him outside the home. ما كان يصنع ابن عمر في منزله قال لا تتيقونه You ask how Ibn Umar was at home you would not be able to match him. They said, no, tell us. Tell us what his life was inside the house. That's it. Ibn Umar would perform a fresh wudu for salah, and then until the next salah, he would sit down and read the Quran. There was nothing else there. That was his entire life. He would read Quran, pray salah. Read Quran, and then the next salah. Nafi' narrates that when Ibn Umar radiallahu an, أن ابن عمر كان إذا فاتته العشاء في جماعة أحيا بقية ليلته. That if he missed Isha salah in jama'ah, he would then spend the rest of the night in worship. He would not sleep that night. Nafi' narrates, what a student. All the details, everything. He saw it all, observed it all, preserved it all. Nafi' narrates, مات ابن عمر حتى ما مات ابن عمر حتى أعتق ألف إنسان أو زاد. That my master and teacher Abdullah bin Umar radiAllahu anhu did not leave this world until he had freed over one thousand slaves. He would set him free and set him free, and anyone he saw in slavery, wherever he could, he would purchase them and set them free. Nafi' narrates. Muawiyah radiallahu an sent Ibn Umar radiallahu an 100,000 coins bi mi'ati alf fama hala alayhi al hawlu wa indahu minha shay. One year had not even passed by and he had nothing left. Ibn Umar radiallahu an spent all 100,000 on the fuqara and the masakin. His students narrate. That when Ibn Umar radiallahu an was in a public area, خرجت مع Ibn Umar فما لقي صغيرا ولا كبيرا إلا سلم عليه. Every person he passed by, if it was a young child or an elderly person, every person that he passed by, Ibn Umar radiallahu an would give salam to them, which is a sign of not only his love for the Sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but you can also see from this. His humility and his humbleness, that's such a great giant and scholar and sahabi of Rasulullah wasallam. you would expect people would come and say salam to him, to honor him. But before they even noticed him, Ibn Umar radiallahu would approach them and he would give them salam. He was such a lover of the sunnah that not only did he practice it, but he refused to follow the footsteps of people who went against the sunnah. That's another side of following the sunnah. One thing is that individually, a person does everything to follow the sunnah. On the other side, you see someone else doing something and promoting something that seems to be religious, a bid'ah, and you just walk away. It's none of my business. No. They made it their problem. They made it their business because they understood, as the scholars teach us, the opposite of sunnah, just as the opposite of uh, night is day, just as the opposite of hot is cold, the muhadithun and the ahlul lugha, they say the opposite of sunnah is Bid'ah. They are literally opposites. The two cannot coexist. Either you have a bid'ah or you have a sunnah. Right? So, Ibn Umar radiallahu an, one time he was with someone and a person next to him sneezed. 
So the individual who was responding to the sneeze, he said, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. When a person sneezes, they say, Alhamdulillah. In response, we are taught by the Prophet of Allah to say, Yarhamukallah. May Allah's mercy be upon you. But instead of saying Yarhamukallah, he said something else, which is actually very beautiful what the man said. The man said, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah, all praises for Allah and may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet of Allah. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh said, Wa ana aqulu alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Lakin ma hakada allamana Rasulullah. That I also say this, I believe in this too, that all praises for Allah and peace and blessings be upon the Prophet of Allah. But this is not what the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say at this point. The Prophet of Allah taught us that when someone sneezes and they say alhamdulillah, in response we should say, he taught the person the lesson immediately. A person came from Kufa to Ibn Umar an, and he said that people in Kufa have started making some interesting claims. The famous um, theological deviance that began to spread in Kufa was Al Amru Anifun, which meant that there is no predestination, God does not know of anything before it happens. There's nothing written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no documentation of any of it. Everything just happens. As Hollywood says, every man creates their own destiny. Right? So that's the idea. That there's nothing written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We aren't slaves of gods. We aren't servants of God. Everything's already written. Now, Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, when he heard this, he immediately said that, uh, he was, they were referring to Ma'bad al-Juhani in the group. So in response to that, Ibn Umar radiallahu an said that go and tell them that I have nothing to do with them. And they will have nothing to do with me until they believe in Qadr. That we Muslims believe that good, fate, good and bad are both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every human being the ability to choose. Every, ability, every human being chooses between what they do. Right now you can choose to sit here or walk out of this room. This is your choice. But the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has of what you will choose is with Allah and it cannot change. You know, the, the word for this concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has a knowledge of everything that we do in Arabic is qadr, which could also be literally translated as an estimation. And a person's estimation is based off of how well they know something. Someone knows a car well, you ask them how much is this car, they'll say that, oh, it's $5,000. You ask me who knows nothing about cars, you know, how much is this car worth? I might say 50000 It means nothing because I don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of his creation. He knows every intimate thought, every intimate detail. If a father can almost tell you what his son will do, if a mother can tell you that how will my child respond to this scenario, if a brother can say that about his brother, if a friend can say that about their friend, with limited knowledge, no matter how much we claim to know them, imagine the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And beyond that, Time and space in itself are both creations of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bound by them. God is not bound by His own creation. So what exists for us over a period of time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if it's all in one moment. Allah's knowledge is complete. Now we do accept that the human being has the ability to make decisions and make good choices. So when the Prophet of Allah was asked regarding the matter of taqdeer, someone said, oh, God, oh Messenger of Allah, if everything's already been written, then what's the point? What's the point of doing anything? And that's the beauty of Islam, that these questions were asked directly to the Prophet of Allah. You look at, for example, Christianity, and you look at the Gospels, you look at St. Paul and his teachings. These are all people who narrate from Isa alayhi salam 40 to 50 years after his lifting from the dunya. None of these people actually lived during the time of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam or actually narrate directly from Isa alayhi salam, you know, Prophet Jesus. They don't narrate directly from him. They, they weren't direct students of his. You know, Saul, Paul, never saw Isa alayhi salam during his life. He never met with him. Yet, such a significant part of Christianity is based off of his testimony, his teaching, his preaching. He never saw Isa alayhi salam once in his life. And the same could be said regarding the other Gospels. And in Islam, the story is very different. In Islam, 
These questions were asked directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered these issues one by one directly himself. That a Messenger of Allah, what's the purpose of you know, doing things if it's all just written by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala? If everything's already written, what's the point? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered back by saying, اِعْمَلُوا فَكُلٌّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ You are trying to contend with the knowledge of God. If a person claims that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala did not know what Abdurrahman is going to do in the next moment, that means we claim deficiency in God's knowledge. And as Muslims, that is impossible. We refuse any deficiency in our God. In Allah Azawajal in the Quran says, Al Alim Al Khabir, all knowing, very well, fully informed. Not one thing passes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but He knows it. However, in this moment right now, for every for everything that you do, there are multiple options, and you need to choose which option you will you with you wish to you wish to take on, which one you wish to be held accountable for. And that option, even though in this moment it's your choice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of it. And the knowledge of something does not equate to, is not equal to an action. I can have knowledge of something, but that knowledge in itself isn't enough until I actually do it. If a person goes to court and says, I have knowledge that tomorrow this person is going to do something, it means nothing. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes the hisab not based off of only his knowledge that something was going to happen, but rather based off of the actions, you, what you did in the dunya. Someone asked Mu'ana Tanvi rahmatullahi alayhi that how much of my qadr, how much of my taqdeer do I actually have control of? So Mu'ana Tanvi rahmatullahi alayhi gave a beautiful analogy. He said, you're standing on two feet, raise one. He raised one. He said, now raise the other. He said, I can't. That's the reality. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, while explaining once the issue of qadr, one time he was traveling and he stopped over for um, salah. So he told a person, would you mind watching over my horse? Let me go inside and pray. So the man was watching over Ali radiallahu anhu's horse. He went inside, he prayed his prayer. When he came back out, the horse was there, his saddle was gone. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu in that moment was actually holding on to 10 dirhams, 10 golden coins. 10 dinar, sorry. And his intention was to give that guy, that dirham, that silver, that dinar, that golden coin, he was going to give the guy some money as a kind, as a kind gesture, as a gift, a thank you for waiting for me. But now that he got outside, that money that he was holding in his hand, he couldn't give it to that person anymore, he put it back in his pocket, the guy was missing, his saddle was missing. Couldn't ride a horse without a saddle, that's dangerous. So he walked his horse to the nearby market, he found a store that was selling saddles and he went to a guy and he said, I need to buy a saddle. The guy said, well describe for me what you want. And he described his, the saddle that he was looking for, like something with this specification, this material, this, this, that. That guy said, oh well you're in luck, I just came into the perfect saddle for you. He pulls out Ali radiallahu anhu's saddle. This is a saddle right here. Ali radiallahu anhu says, that's my saddle. He said, well, I bought it, so you're going to buy it. I put money into this. Ali radiallahu anhu agrees, he purchases a saddle, mounts it on his animal. Right when he's about to leave, he turns back to the man and asks him, how much did he sell it to you for? He said, for 10 coins. Ali radiallahu anhu turned to his companions and says, 10 coins were always his taqdeer. He was destined to have those 10. Whether he received them through halal or haram was his choice. He chose the wrong path. اِعْمَلُوا فَكُلٌّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates the path for which you were created. Focus on what you can do in this moment. That's where your focus should be. And if things don't work out for you, it's okay. Go back to the drawing board and continue. Sometimes you give it your best and the class doesn't work out. The job doesn't work out. The relationship doesn't work out. It's okay. وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ Fate, good and bad, are both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we exercise gratitude to Allah. We learn to be thankful. That I'm thankful that things are going good right now, they're going well in my life. I'm thankful that I have freedom, I'm thankful that I have shelter, I'm thankful that I have faith, I'm thankful that I have wealth. I'm thankful for the people that love me and the people that I'm able to love. Shukr. And on the other hand, there are rough days. And when those rough days come, you don't run away, you exercise patience. And that's one of the major differences between an atheist and a theist. The atheist rejects God the moment things get tough. 
Why didn't God give me what I wanted when I wanted? And the simple analogy that I give for an atheist is equivalent to a child who's in a store with their parent and they're driving and they're rolling past the, the candy aisle and the child says to mom, mom, buy me candy. And mom says, I'm not going to buy you candy. And the kid says, mom, you hate me. You're not my mom anymore. I don't love you. And mom was like, okay, buddy. Why don't you calm down a little bit? Why don't you settle in? I still love you. Right? Saying that I'm not your mother doesn't change anything. While the believer, on the other hand, no matter how difficult things get, remains patient. Things don't always work out. Sometimes it's your calamities that break your ego away and help you come back into touch with your own reality. Calamities are powerful if you let them do what they're supposed to do. Tests in life could spiritually elevate you to a point that you wouldn't be able to reach on with your own worship even if you tried. I think of challenges in life kind of like a catalyst. Expedites the process. The chemical reactions are so much faster. If you're kind of growing like this gradually, a musiba comes in and just vertical growth, instant growth. The story in the Quran of all the prophets, all the prophets, all the righteous people that are referenced in the Quran, they are not mentioned as biographical entries. Rather, they are mentioned in the Quran as men and women who faced difficulty in life and they didn't give up on Allah. They remained loyal and patient and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved them so much that their stories were crystallized for eternity in the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of them, Ayyub alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam, Zakaria alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, every single one of them, the same story every single time. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, when he was asked this question, Al-Amru anifun, that is it true that there is no such thing as taqdeer? He said, I have nothing to do with these people. And they have nothing to do with me until they believe in taqdeer. Ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala narrates, one of the students of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh, that a person once offered him jawarish. A person offered him jawarish. Qara wa mahua. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh had no idea what this jawarish was. He said, what's jawarish? So he said, this is something that we eat after we have a big heavy meal and we're full, you know, like, You've had four slices of Chicago-style deep dish Giordano's pizza, and you're like completely bloated and you can't turn left or right, you're maxed out. He said, when we eat a lot, and you're having tough digesting that food, we eat jawarish to help with the digestion. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh said, مَا شَبِعْتُ مُنذُ أَرْبَعَةِ أَشْهُرِ I haven't eaten to my full in four months. And then he said, and it's not because وَمَا ذَاكَ أَلَّا أَكُونَ لَهُ وَاجِدًا وَلَكِنِّي أَهِدْتُ قَوْمًا يَشْبَعُونَ مَرَّةً وَيَجُعُونَ مَرَّةً And it's not because I didn't have the ability to eat, but rather it's because I made a commitment to a people who would eat one day, eat a meal, and then stay hungry for the next one. They didn't always eat. These were people that weren't just sat filling themselves. And that's the American problem. That's the Western problem. That we're just so greedy with our appetites. Just eat and eat and eat, and we're not thinking about it. We don't care about what it's doing to our bodies. You know, the most advanced nation, uh, possibly when it comes to science and technology and innovation, but the most obese as well. We're up there, man. And you look at the Muslim world and you look at the third world as well. They were actually doing much better before we started giving them all of our artificial food, before we started sending them, you know, uh, McDonald's and Twinkies and, and soda. Those people were doing quite decent. And then we started sending them all sorts of junk food and now people are just hooked on to that cheap meal. You go to the Middle East now, I went to Saudi and like, I was trying to have a healthy meal and the only thing I could find that was close to being healthy was fried chicken. Not even al-bayk, al-fayk. Like, <laughs> everywhere you go, it says fried chicken and I'm like, come on, give me some. Can I buy a salad? I did not see one salad store in the entire Makkah. Their salta is like not even like a full salad. It's like desi salad. Desi salad is like sliced carrots, sliced cucumbers, and beets with chutney on the side. 
If you're not this, you're like, what in the world is going on? What am I, what is this for, the rabbit or something? Salta. Sayyidina Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, this is a powerful narration. The son of the bit has some du'af in it. That Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, one day, he came outside, and while he was walking, he saw that everyone had gathered. So he asked them, what's going on? They said, Asadun ala tariqi qad habis an nas. There's a lion in the road. So everyone's, you know, there's a wild cat there. People are being cautious. People are trying to wait it out to see what happens next. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anh dismounted and he went to the lion and literally held it by the ear. He then held the animal and pulled it aside. He held the lion and pulled it aside. People are shocked, like, what? What is this guy doing? Does he not have any fear? And then he said, I heard the Prophet of Allah saying, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَالْ لَوْ لَمْ يَخِفِ آدَمَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ لَمْ يُصَلِّتْ عَلَيْهِ غَيْرَهُ That had the son of Adam not feared anyone other than Allah, no one would overcome the insan. It's that we have started fearing others, that's why their fear has entered into our hearts. This applies to jinn as well. The Muslims are very terrified of jinn. There's no need to be afraid of them. Allah gave you honor. There's no need to be afraid of any, any animal, any creation. You have this like six foot dude who weighs like 200 pounds and he's terrified of a cockroach. God created you superior. Have some dignity. You're jumping in the air like a young child by the passing of a small mouse. Not even the size of this cup. You know, what happened to the insan? The statement of Ibn Umar radiallahu anh is quite profound. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave the human being honor over all. That you don't fear anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You ever seen someone fearless, just approach a lion or a wild animal and control it. Have you guys ever seen that? Yes, no, I've seen it. It's crazy. You know, th these people, I, w I was in um, Zambia, in like kind of southern part of Africa. And um, my teacher asked me to go there, you know, to teach Islam to some of the people there and spend time with the Muslims. So we were literally in... Uh, what they call the bush, like we were in the jungle. And so we're driving in this car, this guy's driving me, and he, he literally chopped the top part of his car off. So it's open. And as we're driving, we're passing by, I, this is, I saw this with my own eyes. We're driving past hyenas, we're driving past giraffes, going past so many rhinos just sitting on the side of the bank, passing by like bulls and buffaloes and all the animals. So then we're passing by one area. He said, this area is known for cheetahs and lions. So we saw, the, we saw them. There was a group of female lions by the side. And this dude's getting closer. I'm telling him, you know, Ismail, why don't you slow down a little bit? We don't need to go that close. My camera has a zoom-in feature. We don't need to go any closer. Because Mufti Saab, that's how he used to always say, Mufti Saab, you don't need to be afraid of anything. I'm here. I said, aren't you afraid? He said, no. I said, what would you do if that lion from there pounced on us? Because there's nothing on top of us. There's no security, no safety. What would you do right now if that lion right there, five softs away, jumps on us? This man holds up his big light that he's holding in his hand. He goes, I'd hit it with this. Not afraid at all, man. That didn't increase my confidence in him. <laughs> But I definitely saw what confidence was. The guy's not afraid. You put me up against that guy, I'll take him down. And it's not false confidence either. Like it's a, it's a state that these people are not afraid. You look at the, like, you know, in Afghanistan, these people are not afraid of tanks. They're not afraid of jets. They're tough. They're really tough people. They look at the enemy and they say, you should be afraid of me, not the other way around. The son of Adam did not fear anyone other than Allah. Nothing else would overcome him. One person came to Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, because Ibn Umar radiallahu anh avoided 
participating in any of the wars between any of the Sahaba. You know, any disputes or anything, he said, I'm not going to get involved in any of this. Uh, and it was beautiful that he didn't. Because politics are just an ongoing story. There's always going to be an up and down. You need some people in the community that kind of stay away from the politics and teach and educate people, not dividing the people. Because once you're a part of one party, when people from the other group see you, they won't study from you because why? Oh, you're from that group. There's some assumption that this person is going to feed an agenda to me. Ibn Umar made it a policy that I am a teacher. Everyone learns the hadith from me and I want to remain that. So I'm not going to get involved in any of this, right? He chose not to be a part of it. So a person once came to Ibn Umar and he said to him, you know that hadith that we always hear that Islam is based on five pillars? You guys know that narration? Islam is built on five pillars. We teach it to kids in Sunday school, in the khatiras, at interfaith. Islam is based on five pillars. Most of you may not know this. That narration is narrated by Ibn Umar And the reason why he narrated that hadith is this. A person came to Ibn Umar trying to guilt trip him. He said that, why don't you go for jihad? Everyone's going for jihad. Why don't you go for jihad? So at that point, Ibn Umar in response to him said, Bunya al-Islam wa ala khams, Islam is built on five pillars and jihad is not one of those five pillars. That's how he quoted that narration to him. That we believe in God. Salah, zakah, Psalm, hajj. Is jihad fighting in the battlefield obligatory? It could be in certain circumstances. Your city is getting ransacked. You can't stand at home with your, um, with your cheese and crackers. You got to get up and go fight. You got to defend the people. That's a time, you know. But overall in Islam, we don't have this concept that everyone's in barbaric mode where we're all just fighting and shooting and killing and blowing up each other. Kind of like what, you know, Hollywood wants people to believe. Like they're always showing Muslim as a crazy cuckoo guy. That's, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is making it a point that Islam is a, jihad is a tool that Muslims use if there is a need for it. If we get pushed, we will push back. If there is a need, we will stand up. If there is a need, if oppression becomes common, we will stand up to establish justice. Islam is not some pacifist religion, some so-called Buddhist faith. That's not what it is. Islam believes in justice. And if there is oppression, the, the, the Muslim ruler, if there is one at any given time in any given state, can pass a ruling that Muslims get up and spread justice. But it's not one of the five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam that apply to everyone at all times. Bunyal Islam wa khams. And then he narrates these five um, pillars. So that questioner, he then cited a verse to Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, Surah Hujrat, verse number eight, that, okay, I'll accept that one. But what about the ayah, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَنَ الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ الله. He cited this verse. So Ibn Umar radiallahu an responded back to him, what about the ayah of the Qur'an? وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا That whoever kills another believer intentionally will be in the fire of hell eternally. You're going to kill people? He's, he's saying, I, I, I'm not going to fight. You can't shame me into fighting. I'm not going to go fight against another Muslim, another mu'min. So then that guy said, what about the ayah? وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةً Surah Baqarah 193. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anh said to him that you've misunderstood this verse. This verse is talking about the early days of Islam where Muslims weren't even allowed to practice their faith, they were tortured. So then Allah Azza wa Jal, when we arrived in Medina Munawwara gave us permission to fight, to defend ourselves, to establish our own land and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely. Now Islam has become abundant. وَلَمْ تَكُنْ fitna, And there is no fitna anymore. This ayah does not apply. He's a mufassir. You can't shame him into you know, partially stating this and partially stating that. He is a knowledgeable man who saw revelation come down upon Rasulullah He lived with the Prophet of Allah. When he realized that he couldn't convince Ibn Umar an, he said, The man was one of these trolls from you know, social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram. So he said, so what's your opinion regarding Uthman an and Ali radiallahu an? So he said, Uthman radiallahu an, like the other companions, was forgiven by Allah. You, choose, you people choose not to forgive him. If he did anything, you people are the ones that hold grudges, not me. I don't have a grudge against another companion. As for Ali radiallahu an, he was the cousin of the Prophet of Allah 
the son-in-law of the Prophet of Allah, and his house was right here. He pointed towards the area in front of him, was right next to the house of the Prophet That's what he meant to the Prophet of Allah. So what opinion do I have? Ali radiallahu anh is beloved to us just as he was beloved to the Prophet Now we go to the end of Ibn Umar radiallahu anh's life. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh um, passes from this world in the 73rd year after migration. 73rd year after migration. There's a lot going on at this time politically. There's a lot of things happening. Hajjaj bin Yusuf has just basically ransacked Makkah Mukarramah to bring down Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anh, who was the established Khalifa in Makkah. We covered Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anh's story and actually his mother's story, um, Asma radiallahu anha, earlier in our classes. So after Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anh was martyred, um, Hajjaj bin Yusuf, the man who orchestrated the whole thing, the general behind the Umayyad army, he was delivering a sermon and he began to say very foul things against certain companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Umar radiallahu anh stood up. He was an old man, senior person. Some historians say he was around 87 years old, in his mid to late 80s. He heard the man speaking foul about a sahabi, so Ibn Umar radiallahu anh stood up and he said, O oh, enemy of Allah, stop it. You say bad things about the companions, you desecrated the honor of the Kaaba by bringing war here. This was a land that people were not allowed to have weapons in. And you brought weapons here, you brought an army here, you fought a war in Mecca. Who does, such, who does something like this? Hajjaj bin Yusuf was a foul man. So he turned to Ibn Umar radiallahu anh and in front of everyone publicly he said, this man is senile, he's lost his brains, he's no good. Then Hajjaj bin Yusuf called one of his people and instructed him to inflict a wound on Ibn Umar radiallahu anh with a poisoned uh, weapon. فَلَمَّا صَدَرَ النَّاسُ أَمَرَ الْحَجَّاجُ بَعْدَ مُسَوَّدَتِهِ فَأَخَذَ حَرْبَةً مَسْمُومَةً وَضَرَبَ بِهَا رِجْلَ إِبْنِ عُمَرْ فَمَرِضَ وَمَاتَ مِنْهَا That man came and he made a small cut on Ibn Umar radiallahu an, which led to Ibn Umar radiallahu an's health deteriorating significantly. When he was on his deathbed, Hajjaj bin Yusuf came to visit him. And he played innocent. He said, is there anything I can do for you? Point out who cut you and I will deal with him. So Ibn Umar radiallahu an first didn't respond and when Hajjaj kept trying to make a scene, Ibn Umar radiallahu anh turned towards him and he said, you were the one who killed me. He said, how could you say such a thing? So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anh then repeated that before your arrival, there was none of this in Mecca. There were no weapons here. This was a safe town. This is a haram, a sanctuary. Whoever cut me did it because you allowed it to happen. You're the one who brought all these weapons into Mecca Mukarramah. You're the one who bought the war here. You're the one who bought the fight here. And as Ibn Umar radiallahu anh was on his um, deathbed, his student narrates that the last thing that he uh, stated regret over was uh, not being able to spend more time in this world worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, man, I wish I could live longer to worship Allah more, to fast more, to do more good deeds. And I also regret not standing up against the rebel group uh, when they stood up against the Khalifa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the maqam of Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh. So many lessons to learn from him. There are, again, there's so many, there are so many stories and so many anecdotes. So many things that we can learn from Ibn Umar radiallahu Everything had a place in time. One time Ibn Umar radiallahu anh was doing tawaf of the Kaaba, a person came to him and said, I would like to marry your daughter. In the middle of his tawaf. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anh didn't even respond to him, he just kept walking. That guy felt so shameful that, man, I wanted to marry that guy's daughter and I took my moment. You know how young people, when they get excited, sometimes they get a little nervous too. So he's thinking, man, what's Ibn Umar radiallahu anh think of me? And he's so nervous and shocked. After his, uh, after his, did his, finished his time in Mecca, he went to Medina, this person. And Ibn Umar radiallahu anh was already in Medina. When he met Ibn Umar radiallahu anh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anh called him. He said, weren't you the guy who wanted to marry my daughter? 
He said, yes. So then Ibn Umar very compassionately, softly says to him, buddy, there's a place and time for everything. That's not the time and place for it. When we're doing tawaf around the Kaaba, are we supposed to be thinking about like marriage? No, oh, you're worshiping Allah. You're supposed to think about your ibadah. And then he says to him, okay, tell me about yourself. Are you still interested? He said, yes. Ibn Umar said, I do have a daughter who's interested in marriage too. He presented himself. Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar an, then sought the opinion of his daughter. He called two of his sons and did the nikah right there. There's a time and place for everything. So many lessons from the wisdom and knowledge of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. May Allah Azza wa Jalla allow us to learn and follow their footsteps. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.